It is the height of the summer holiday season of the year 2000, and Europe's economy is booming. Paris's Charles de Gaulle Airport is bustling with tourists coming and going. 100 passengers are about to board the Concorde for a transatlantic flight. Most of them are from Germany, en route for New York City, where they will board a Caribbean cruise to Ecuador. The idyllic career of a plane that was considered the epitome of elegance, speed and luxury travel is about to come to a tragic end. C'est vraiment la définition, on peut dire que c'est quelque part la définition même de l'accident. It is the definition, one can say it is the definition of an accident that happens when conditions are standard, normal, not catastrophic the weather, the wind. Everything suggests a normal flight. And in the space of less than a few seconds, overall maybe, the whole thing was over in a minute, we get one of the great catastrophes of aviation. It was a whole chain of events, an error chain of events, and it was the cumulative effect of all these errors that led to that accident. It was nothing to do with design weaknesses in Concorde. These are the only moving images ever recorded of the Concorde on fire. It is clear that the giant of the skies is struggling to take to the air. Aboard, the passengers must know there's a serious problem. The charismatic captain, Christian Marty, is struggling with the controls to keep it in the air. A few seconds later, the Hotelissimo Les Relais Bleus is a pile of burning rubble. Concorde Flight 4590 has crashed into it, destroying it in a ball of fire from the burning jet fuel. A sequence of apparently insignificant events ended up killing all 109 people on board and four on the ground. What actually did go wrong? in the afternoon of the 25th of July, 2000. July 25th, 2000. At the controls of the Concorde, in the cramped cockpit of the supersonic airliner, is Christian Marty, 54 years old and the first man to windsurf across the Atlantic. He is a man of experience, a charismatic pilot. Aviation journalist Bernard Chabert knew him well. L'équipage était commandé par un garçon absolument the crew was captained by an absolutely phenomenal guy who was both a high-level sportsman, the first man to cross the Atlantic on a windsurf from Europe to Antilles. I knew him a bit. I'd flown with him. My wife, who was a hostess with Air France, had flown with him often. He was truly remarkable. À cette époque-là, avait souvent volé avec lui. C'était absolument quelqu'un de totalement exceptionnel. First officer Jean Marco and flight engineer Gilles Jardineau make up one of the most experienced flight crews in the business. It is about three in the afternoon and they are ready for takeoff. John Hutchinson flew the Concorde for 15 years. Somewhere before they requested the taxi clearance, the captain had requested the full length of the runway. The first few hundred meters of the runway were actually being resurfaced. And the tower, I presume, reminded him of this. And he said, no, 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 I, I realize that, but I still want the full length of the runway. So they cleared him for taxiing for a takeoff for the full runway length. The aircraft begins to taxi down the runway. It has started from very far back as it will need all the runway for takeoff. But the plane is overloaded and full of fuel. Just 
to make it clear the captain for whatever reason had decided to take two tons of taxi fuel which is a lot of taxi fuel and that was located in tank 11 at the back here um, and that two tons of taxi fuel has to be burnt off before you start the takeoff that's not fuel that you're going to take into the air with you that's fuel that's used for taxiing only it needs to reach a speed known technically as V for velocity 1. To do this, all four engines need to be at full power. V1 is the decision speed below which, if you have an emergency, you reject the takeoff and you can then stop the aeroplane on the remaining length of runway. Any emergency after V1, you have to take that emergency into the air with you and deal with it once you're safely climbing away and got the aeroplane fully under control. The pilot pushes the throttles forward to get the four afterburners pushing at maximum power. But then Marty receives devastating information. There is a fire trailing the left wing, just as the co-pilot announces they have reached the speed to begin takeoff known as VR, rotation speed. Exactly at that moment, an Air France jumbo stops at the edge of the runway waiting to cross. The French president is aboard. Its trajectory and its, in its short flight took it diverging away from the runway to the left-hand side. And this Concorde ended up actually flying over the top of the 747. One of the four wheels now rolled on the concrete of the runway. Rubbing against the concrete, the aircraft deviated from its straight path. The crew then corrected this lurch. It's very probable that in their minds and in the mind of the captain, Christian Marti, they understood that one of the tires had burst on one side that was causing this lurching. But since he was deviating from his trajectory and he had reached takeoff speed, he decided to take off. Now he needs to get the landing gear up to reduce drag and get the aircraft flying and bring it back under control. The landing gear does not come up. On the ground, the control tower looks on aghast as the Concorde leaves the runway but fails to reach cruising altitude. The last words spoken aboard are Le Bourget, as the pilot attempts to keep the plane flying long enough to get to the airfield to the south. These were the last clear words heard in the cockpit of Air France Flight 4590 before it crashed into the hotel. La dernière tentative de l'équipage, puisqu'il y a en bout de piste. The last attempt on the part of the pilot. Since at the end of the Roissy Charles de Gaulle runway, a little to the left, is the Le Bourget airport. So the last thing we hear from the crew is that, out of desperation, they wanted to turn to Le Bourget. That was just there. They were just 15 seconds away. But in any case, arriving on the Le Bourget airport, they would have crashed anyway because the landing gear, due to hydraulic problems, as they are controlled by the hydraulic energy of the aircraft, the undercarriage had started to retract and was blocked halfway and would not have been able to resist the weight of the aircraft. And the aircraft would probably have broken up on touching the ground. There were no survivors. A sequence of tiny errors caused the only ever Concorde crash, but also brought the curtain down on one of the greatest legends of aerospace. Toulouse, France, February 1969. The Concorde supersonic airliner takes to the sky for the very first time. This aircraft doesn't only push engineering boundaries, picking up where Nazi Germany had left off, but political ones too. When we see an aircraft today, 
We see the work of German aeronautical engineers, the swept wing, hyperlift with wing slats, jets attached to the wings, jet propulsion itself. All this was begun in Germany, but also at the same time was begun in Great Britain. So the British aircraft industry was in the forefront, especially in the area of performance. En point avancé, surtout dans le domaine des performances. It is the first aircraft to be built by two nations, under a deal signed by France's General Charles de Gaulle and the British government under Harold Wilson. And, um, if it succeeds and Concorde goes into service, as we all hope, it will mean that in one single aircraft development, the work of the last 50 years will have been doubled in efficiency. It's an astonishing uh, project, Concorde, from this point of view. Anglais comme Français, the British, like the French, had decided that the next step was to go faster than the speed of sound to be supersonic, and the British had designed a plane that looked overall like what Concorde would become, and the French, independently, had designed an aircraft that looked enormously like what Concorde actually became. And then the two projects were costed, and they realized that the project cost more than either nation could afford. So a certain financial realism was accepted, which led to the principle that if we couldn't do something by ourselves, let's join forces and we'll get there. The aircraft itself was revolutionary. It built on precious experience gathered by Germany during the war in the use of jet propulsion and the original Delta wing, which helped lift the plane in takeoff and limit drag in flight. Sur Concorde, à cause de l'aile Delta, on avait choisi l'aile Delta parce que c'est la forme d'aile. On Concorde, the Delta Wing was chosen because it allows for very high speeds, supersonic speeds, Mach 2, for example, but also because it's a wing that is light, and from the designer's point of view, the wing needed to fly, but also be light and strong, very, very strong from an aerodynamic point of view. So they discovered the Germans first, and then after the war, everyone discovered that the Delta Wing was the most elegant and technically reasonable solution to reach very high speeds. Des manières les plus élégantes et techniquement raisonnables d'atteindre les très hautes vitesses. The way this wing created lift was somewhat different from a conventional wing. When you're talking about slow speeds, and by that I mean speeds below about 270 knots. 270 knots and below, with this high angle of attack that you would have to be flying at that low speed. The way you were creating lift at those low speeds was not by having a laminar flow over the wing surface, but by creating a massive rolling vortex over each wing. And it was the low pressure within that vortex on each wing that gave you the lift. The Concorde's wing shape was a modified delta tested for months in wind tunnels to get just the right shape for maximum aerodynamic efficiency. To minimize drag, it soared so high that its maximum cruise altitude was 18,300 meters, or 60,000 feet. Passengers could see the curvature of the Earth. It had an average cruise speed of Mach 2.02, 2,150 kilometers per hour, or 1,330 miles per hour, more than twice the speed of conventional aircraft. The Concorde also had something no other plane had, the iconic droop nose. This special snoot was designed so the pilots could lower the front cone for better visibility during takeoff and landing, which had to have a very high angle of attack due to the plane's design. Well, there were various positions for the nose. Um, it was the nose fully up and the visor up, and that's, as you see it here in this model, streamlined, beautiful streamlined shape for high-speed flight. The first stage was to lower the visor, the heat shield, down into the nose cone, where it remained stowed. You'd then lower the nose to five degrees, and that was the position that the 
um, that you had the nose for takeoff, for taxiing around the airfield, and for flight in the airport area, in the terminal area. And then the final position was the nose fully down at 12 and a half degrees, and you only used that position um, for landing. The other feature of the Concorde was its four huge Olympus jet engines designed by Rolls-Royce. They provided 17,000 kilos of thrust each with afterburners, enough to push the aircraft to Mach 2, more than twice the speed of sound, or 2,146 kilometers per hour. Quand on va plus vite que la vitesse du son, when you go faster than the speed of sound, you have to slow down the airflow because the engine will never accept the airflow. It will refuse to take in air at supersonic speeds. It chokes and then stops. So on the Concorde over the space of just three meters, you have to take in air traveling at over 2,000 kilometers an hour and reduce its speed to 900 kilometers an hour over the space of just three meters. So the intake is equipped with moving panels that reduce the overpressure, that reduces the speed of the air and allows the engine to take in air at a usable speed. Flying above 50,000 feet, basically you're above all the things that cause turbulence. You're above the jet streams, you're above the thunderstorms. So you're flying in this very calm, tranquil atmosphere. And it's the most uncanny feeling, actually. I used to pinch myself in disbelief almost on every flight I ever did, right through to my last flight. Here I was, sitting there, doing 1,350 miles an hour, Mach 2, 55, 56, 58,000 feet. And you had no sensation of speed at all. It was almost as though you felt you were just hanging motionless in space and waiting for Mother Earth to spin around for your destination to arrive below and you then throttle back, re-enter and land. It was that sort of a feeling. However, not all of John's flights were that comfortable. One in particular remains in his memory. We were flying from Washington to London and we were, I don't know, 55, 56,000 feet Mach 2 and I'm just about to eat a nice piece of steak. And suddenly, the airplane started shaking violently. And I mean, really shaking me around. And for a moment, I thought, gosh, this is turbulence. And then I thought, no, 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 that's not turbulence. Um, being a bit slow on the uptake. Um, I realized then that it was a, a, what we call an engine surge at Mach 2. And um, there's a drill for that. And the first item of the drill is to close all four throttles, which is fine. It stops all the banging and the thumping and the shaking, but it's what's driving you along at Mach 2. So the deceleration is, is quite dramatic, actually. Fortunately, there is a way of overriding the aircraft computer, and the Concorde crew in question came up with an idea to avoid slowing the plane dramatically. We've started this drill, and the flight engineer, who was a very switched-on chap of very good friend of mine called Bill Brown, he spotted that the variable geometry intake for the number three engine, for some reason or another, had driven itself fully shut. It was in a position it should not have been in. And consequently, the number three engine was complaining like mad. And he said, look, instead of going through the whole drill, can I just hard select the computer, the alternate computer for controlling that engine? And I said, Bill, if you think that's going to work, go for it. And he hard selected the other computer. And we then very, very carefully opened the throttle, number three throttle up, and it was all fine. We opened up the symmetrical partner, the number two, and it was all fine. Opened up the outboards, and we resumed Mach 2 and carried on towards London. In order to stop it on the runways of the world, thrust reversers were installed, bucket-like doors that close behind the engine nozzles to push the jet flow forward. Today, it takes seven hours to fly from London to New York. The Concorde could make the trip in just over three hours. The price tag was in proportion, over $11,000 round trip, 
and the service on board was touted as impeccable. A stratospheric, supersonic cocktail party in the air. I think the regular users of Concorde, your Rupert Murdoch's, your David Frost's, they used it because it saved them time. It wasn't about comfort. If you want comfort, go first class. Um, I'm not going to pretend that, um, that Concorde offered comfort in the way that you can get great comfort in a first class cabin in a, in a modern airliner. Um, but it got you from A to B pretty damn quickly. And that's why people used it. It saved them time and saved them money as a consequence. Cet avion avait un intérêt évidemment pour simplement ceux qui devaient travailler à New York. Mais vous prenez cet avion à 11 heures. This aircraft was interesting for people who had to work in New York. You'd take it at 11 a.m. in Paris, you'd get to New York at 9 a.m. You'd have a whole day of work. You'd retake the Air France, not the Concorde, but a good 747 at 8.30 p.m. You'd sleep in the plane and you'd be in court by 9 a.m. in Paris. So it was unheard of to travel, spend a day in New York and continue the next day in Paris without being tired. Et comment tu continues la journée d'après à Paris Et en n'étant pas fatigué. However, the Concorde was designed to maximize fuel tanks because of the huge consumption needed to fly at that speed over vast distances. The whole wing, narrow as it was, was in fact a fuel tank. Dans l'aile, les réservoirs Inside the wings, due to the geometry of the wing on Concorde, the fuel tanks are deep down the wing, while on traditional wings they are long and laterally along the wings, whereas delta wings are deep. Concorde was fast, but also a heavy gas guzzler, required a specially trained crew, and was annoyingly recognizable to those on the ground below for its massive sonic boom strong enough to damage windows. The Concorde was vulnerable in other areas too. The tires had to withstand the enormous pressure of the four engines pushing at full power to take off. Over the years, the tire specifications were improved, especially after a non-fatal incident in 1979 at Dulles Airport in Washington. Almost all orders for the design were cancelled by 1976 as Ban the Boom backlash over the Concorde's unmistakable sonic boom mounted. Eventually, only Air France and British Airways ever flew the Concorde. Les Anglais, ils avaient une ligne qui était très fructueuse, plus the British had a very profitable route, more profitable than the French route. The problem with this plane was essentially that it was not produced in large numbers, so it couldn't be developed over time. And a plane that can't be developed is stopped earlier than a plane that is constantly developed, such as the 747 that looks exactly the same as the original plane, but today is completely different internally, with the mechanics, the avionics, nothing is the same. It's completely different because the plane was developed. The Concorde was not developed. So it had to stop earlier than other planes. The Concorde was developed. The Concorde was not developed. So it had to stop earlier than other planes. Both British Airways and Air France continued their regular and costly transatlantic flights until 2003 three years after the crash of Flight 4590. They also rented out Concords to premium travel agencies. Flight 4590 had been rented by German cruise company Peter Dielmann Cruises. Most of the 100 passengers were headed to New York for a cruise to Ecuador. Well, first of all, I should say that the airplane was delayed because there was a problem with the thrust reverser and the captain quite properly and correctly decided to delay the flight until that thrust reverser problem had been fixed. And it delayed the airplane by, I can't remember, by about an hour, something like that. On the 25th of July, 2000, the passengers were due to board at 1.35 p.m. But there was a delay. Engine number four had a problem with the thrust reverser. <laughs> 
It was just the first hitch of a sequence of errors and misfortunes that led to the crash. Over and beyond the extra taxi fuel, the passengers had more bags than expected. Half an hour or so be before the rescheduled departure time, uh, the dispatcher came up onto the flight deck and announced that there were 19 bags that they couldn't take with them. And the captain said, why? And the dispatcher said, well, because you'll be overweight. And the captain said, well, is there physically room to put those bags somewhere? And he said, yes, in the, in the cargo hold at the back, which is located right there, that cargo hold. And there's 19 bags which were never weighed, never weighed, uh, were stuck into the airplane. One of the wheels on the left undercarriage had been replaced and was missing a spacer, a tool used to keep the wheels aligned in a single direction. And the fuel tanks were full to over the maximum takeoff weight due to the extreme speed and fuel consumption the crew had planned to get the passengers to their destination as fast as possible. The fuel tanks were overfilled, all these tanks in the, in the wing were overfilled so that there was no airspace left in the tanks at all. I guess the only reason you can say that he did that was because he wanted as much fuel on board the aeroplane as possible, um, which is, actually doesn't make a, a lot of sense because if you carry extra fuel, you burn something like 30 to 40 percent of that fuel just for the privilege of carrying it, you know, because it's extra weight. So it's, it's, it's a sort of law of diminishing returns, carrying extra fuel. It was a full flight, an overweight aircraft with a tyre that might be unstable. But now, even more factors contributed to the catastrophe. As they started to line up on the runway, they had 1,200 kilos of fuel located here in Tank 11 that shouldn't have been there. And they'd got the six, seven hundred kilos of baggage located back here, which shouldn't have been there. We're talking about one and three quarter tons, maybe nearly two tons of weight that was well after the center of gravity. It put the airplane over the maximum structural takeoff weight and put it in a situation where the takeoff was being commenced with its C of G position, center of gravity position, aft of the approved limits. Marty requested not only the full length of the runway, but was also allocated a runway close to the terminal building. Marty had not noticed that the wind direction had changed. They not only accepted this clearance on 26 left in this overweight situation with the centre of gravity aft of the aft limits, they also accepted a clearance with a, tail knot, a tailwind an eight-knot tailwind. The aeroplane, when you factor in the tailwind, was probably something like six to seven tons over the weight it should have been at. When you go beyond the integrated factors of rear wind, mass, temperature, and a lot of other parameters, you change direction and you take off the other way around, into the wind. These are the super basics in aviation. So that day, if the aircraft took off, it took off because calculations have been done beforehand again and again, shown to the crew who validated them. So there was nothing strange about taking off that day with that weight and the tailwind and so forth. As he sped up the runway, something else happened that Captain Marty had no control over. At this stage, the airplane was actually steering remorselessly off the left-hand side of the runway. He wasn't able to keep it straight on the center line of the runway. And the reason for that was that he wouldn't have known this, of course, but the front right-hand wheel on the left-hand undercarriage leg had run over this piece of metal left by a Continental Airlines DC-10. It had sliced off a four and a half kilo lump of rubber, which had gone slamming into the underside of the wing by tank number five, 
and caused that tank to rupture. L'avion a roulé. The aircraft, the main undercarriage, the bogey, ran over the metal strip that literally cut the tire. It's titanium. It is a hard metal, light but hard. There was no airspace in that fuel tank to absorb the energy of the shockwave that was caused by the impact of this four and a half kilo lump of rubber slamming into the underside of the wing with considerable force. The shock produced by this enormous chunk of rubber thrown up with enormous energy created a system of shock waves inside the fuel tank and eventually hit the bottom of the tank. The jet fuel began pouring out. And since it was takeoff, the afterburners of the engines were on. It all caught fire because they were vaporized due to the speed of takeoff. So the fuel was pouring out, but vaporized very fast. It all caught fire. The flames went back up to the wing. The spacer was missing on that under undercarriage truck, and it skewed the wheels around because there's nothing now to keep the wheels locked in proper fore and aft alignment, and it was steering, physically steering the airplane off the left-hand side of the runway. And the consequence of that was that the airplane was actually rotated, not at 199 knots, but at about 183, 184 knots, something like 15 knots too early. And I guess that was because um, the captain could see that he was going off the side of the runway. La, la pratique, c'est de décoller the protocol is to take off, go around the runway, and take a little time to empty the fuel tanks in order to land at the right landing weight. So there comes a time when taking off is obligatory. They had passed the decisive moment. They were required to take off, and that's what they did. The crew reacted with the standard procedure in the event of fire without knowing what had happened, however. I believe that that engine was shut down unilaterally by the flight engineer. He'd seen this fire warning, which was a fire warning, but it wasn't a conventional engine fire. It was a fire warning caused by an overheated engine because this blowtorch of fuel was going right past the engine intake and overheating the engine. And that triggered off this fire warning. And he then just carried out a fire drill. He, he shut the engine down, fired the extinguishers without telling the captain at all. And this was conducted at about 25 feet radio altimeter height. The intense fire began eroding the trailing edge of the sail-like wing, precisely the control surface that he needed to lift the aircraft and straighten out. Fly 4590 took to the air just in front of President Chirac's jumbo jet, and these pictures were taken by one of the passengers aboard. So that day, Air France came within 20 feet of one of their Concords hitting one of their 747s with a whole lot of passengers plus the President of France and his wife on board. And I think that would have been a catastrophe from which no airline could possibly have survived. The media attention would have just been frenetic. Marty ordered the undercarriage up, but the plane refused. He had everything against him. He could not turn, so his co-pilot suggested flying to Le Bourget, just a few kilometers away. It was too late. These are the only moving images of the Concorde just after takeoff and already engulfed in flames. Fly 4590 collapsed onto the hotel Hotelissimo Les Relais Bleus. All nine crew, the 100 passengers, and four people working in the Hotelissimo were killed. The hotel was reduced to rubble. 
Investigators arrived on the scene and began putting together a picture of what went wrong. Over the following weeks, the wreck of the aircraft and hotel were piled up in a nearby hangar in the hope that these twisted pieces of metal might reveal the cause of the disaster. The passenger list was examined, and although there were items of luggage whose owners could not be identified, investigators excluded terrorism. They checked the thrust reverser that had been changed and had caused a delay in the flight, but found nothing wrong with it. Investigators also examined the runway from which the aircraft took off, searching for clues. And this is where the first element came to light. A huge chunk of the left tire was found on the runway. Concorde operators began mounting reinforced tires after the earlier incident in 1979 at Dulles Airport, Washington, D.C. But French investigators would later find that Concorde's tires burst 57 different times before the 2000 crash. Um, there was an incident, well, one I can remember quite clearly, where a Concorde had taken off from New York. It wasn't me, actually. And the tire called this Concorde up after it had got airborne, said, is everything OK? And they said, why? And this, as far as we know, yes, why? And they said, well, there's a lot of rubber on the runway. No, well, we've got no symptoms of anything wrong on the airplane at all. And the airplane carried on to New York. It landed at New York, got to the British Airways terminal there. And when they checked it out, a tire had blown during the takeoff and a whole lot of rubber had been ingested through the engine and just spat out of the back end and the engine had kept running all the way across to New York. They are tires designed to withstand landings at 400 kilometers an hour. These tires are not only thick but reinforced. The rubber is incredibly solid and dense. There was no apparent reason, however, for this tire to burst, until investigators also found this twisted piece of metal on the runway, which, amazingly, corresponded to a cut on the tire. It did not take long for the investigators to identify where the piece of metal came from. A Continental Airlines transatlantic flight took off from the same runway just a few minutes beforehand. On inspection in its hangar in the United States, the titanium strip of engine cowling lining was missing. It had been poorly manufactured and even more poorly attached. L'accident est totalement imprévisible. C'est un avion qui roule. The accident is totally unpredictable. The aircraft rolled over a piece from a Continental Airlines plane, a titanium strip that belonged to the thrust reverser. And incredibly, this piece came off. And it can happen, but it twisted in the wind and fell to the runway and fell like a razor blade supported on each end. And when the plane rolled over it, it was inevitable that the tire burst. De chaque côté, l'avion roulant sur cette lamelle en titane, évidemment, ne peut que faire qu'exploser un pneu. But just the tire bursting would not have caused the Concorde to burst into flames so catastrophically. Investigators also began combing the wreckage looking for other clues. They found that the forward bulwark of the wing fuel tank, number five, had burst, which had caused a massive spill of fuel onto the wing that caught fire. From that moment on, the flight was doomed. L'avion a commencé à embarquer. Il a été contré aux, aux, aux commandes de vol, mais l'incendie a également s'est propagé. The aircraft began to lurch sideways, which was compensated for by the flight controls. But the fire had spread in such a way that it began to attack the aircraft's elevons, the control surfaces that allow the aircraft to be maneuvered. And the hydraulic circuits were also disrupted by this fire. And since everything was run using hydraulic systems, physical strength is not enough to fly a plane like that. So 
Without the force of the hydraulic system and without the control surfaces that were burning and falling to pieces, the aircraft became uncontrollable. If he'd been able to comprehend the sheer magnitude of the fire that he was having to deal with, he might well have decided to hell with it. I'm going to just abandon the takeoff and take my chances because I do not want to take the airplane into the air with this great blowtorch of flame coming out of it. But uh, he didn't have that information available to him. So he was operating, you know, basically correctly on the information that he had available to him. Christian Marty struggled to pull the aircraft's nose up because he could not see any other option than to take off. There was not enough runway to abort the takeoff, but nor could he fly around and land. In 2002, the controversial final inquest report was released. Continental Airlines was initially found responsible for triggering the sequence of events that cost the lives of more than 100 people and left the survivors of Hotelissimo traumatized. In that accident report, they blame two things. One is this piece of metal on the runway, and the other is that there were design weaknesses in Concorde. There were no design weaknesses in Concorde, in my opinion, absolutely not. The piece of metal on the runway that had been left by a Continental Airlines DC-10, a little titanium strip. That was a factor in the accident, but this was a classic aircraft accident. It was a whole lot of things that had been done wrong, that had gone wrong, and it was the cumulative effect of all these things that had gone wrong, been done wrong, that led to the final overwhelming catastrophe. Continental Airlines consistently argued the plane was on fire before hitting the strip, but that they were being used as a scapegoat to protect France's airline industry. A French appeals court in 2012 would eventually clear the US airline of any criminal blame, but upheld the finding that Continental did bear some civil liability. The British and French members of the investigation team diverged in their analysis of what went wrong. John Hutchinson believes the plane could have been on fire already as it began its takeoff run. 32 um, witnesses, very credible witnesses, testified to say that there smoke and flames coming out of the left hand undercarriage leg at a very early stage of the takeoff run. And almost certainly, this damage was caused by when the aeroplane went over the ledge as it transitioned on its takeoff from the bit of runway where, where it was being resurfaced to the bit of runway that was, was the correct runway surface. There would have been a slight ledge. As it went over that ledge, it triggered the left-hand undercarriage leg to sort of skew around in a bit because the spacer was missing. The French investigation blamed the fuel tanks. All Air France and British Airways Concords were retrofitted with fuel tank linings. Le BEA a recommandé pour la remise en service de l'avion the BEA recommended that before the aircraft was returned to service, the inside of the wing fuel tanks be lined with Kevlar. Kevlar stops large leaks. Le Kevlar a pour effet d'éviter les grosses fuites. Tires were, yet again, reinforced. There was also some criticism of the maintenance of the Air France aircraft, due to the lack of spacer on the left tire which may have caused the machine to deviate from its course up the runway. But this was found irrelevant in the incident. Air France and Continental together paid out over $100 million in compensation to relatives. There was a transaction first on the civil side. 
il y a eu une transaction entre Air France et les victimes et les familles des victimes. There was a civil transaction between Air France and the families of the victims that was well received by the victims, who were satisfied. And when the trial began, the British lawyer, or the victim's lawyer who was in London at the time, was interviewed by the BBC. And when asked if he was happy that the public trial was about to begin, he said, no, because there's no point. They've been rapidly and adequately compensated, and all this trial does is to bring back their suffering. Elles ont été rapidement et correctement indemnisées et ce procès ne fait que raviver leur douleur. The plane that was once an engineering achievement and the pinnacle of luxury travel is now simply a museum exhibit. It can no longer be admired on the tarmac at airports around the world, but enthusiastic visitors still flock to museums in France and Britain to get a look inside the supersonic jet that could cross the Atlantic in just three and a half hours. <laughs>